Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Welcome to the SOLA seminar. Uh, we're running this as a hybrid seminar where we have the students uh, attending face to face with their masks on, their beautiful masks on, and uh, the rest of you audience online. So as per usual, please make sure that your microphones are muted. Uh, if you have any comments and questions, you can either wait until the end of the seminar, open your mic and ask your question, or uh, write your comments in or question in the chat box, and we will address them at the end of the seminar. Today we have Jill Lawson and uh, Stuart Charters from the School of Landscape Architecture, and um, they will be talking about digital design practices. We have the... What? The... The gear. The gear, but the goods, but not the goods. Um, all right, so enjoy the seminar. Thank you guys for your presentation today. And I'm going to mute myself and leave it up to you. Thanks, Nada. Tenakoto uh, Qatar, Koja Lawson Ahoy. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Jill Lawson, and I'm presenting today with Stuart Charters. Um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about. Um, digital design practice, um, which is a developing field. Now, the last time you know, my computer is really slow and I have to try and be patient with it. It's really slow. Slides. I think it didn't like waiting all that time. It's quite a big um, file size for PowerPoint, so. Ah, oh, hooray. Okay, so last time I spoke about this topic, we talked about different global trends that were happening around the world. And then I tried to align some of the trends that I see for landscape architecture that may be coming up in you know, the near future, actually, not in the distant future, but the near future. Um, uh, the idea of machine learning or artificial intelligence for drawing and modeling isn't very far away. I think it's already happening. Um, learning and teaching via mobile devices anywhere is definitely already a thing. Changes to public open space and travel choices is certainly already happening. And the personalization of university services like timetables and how um, students and staff can access and deliver course material is definitely happening and has certainly accelerated with the um, advent of COVID-19. And particularly at the moment when some people are vaccinated, some people aren't, some people come to campus, some people aren't. And this has all very much become a much more individual choice, um, which is pushing us to our limits. Um, and then we've got face-to-place recognition for access and wayfinding, which is already happening. And we've got virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality for learning and teaching, with simulations and computer human-computer interactions being developed. Um, we'll leave the finance side. So doing um, some library searches on digital landscape architecture, there is a huge amount of growing literature in this field. Um, one of the key books that a lot of us know about is Gillian Wallace and um, Heike uh, Rahman's work on landscape architecture and digital technologies. And I'm going to borrow a little from what they talk about. Um, a large amount of the digitization of landscape architecture has been about drawing or representation, um, which is largely taking what we do in the real world and putting it into the virtual world. But more and more, we're finding now that there's more work being done on generative um, landscape architecture using code and algorithms to create um, rules and design processes that are different actually from the real world. And Stuart found this book by um, Bradley Cantrell on Codify, which is really more for our computing folks. And I found this book by Andrew um, Mardell 
on parametric design for landscape architects. But there's also um, digital landscape architecture has a conference every year, and there's now a journal of digital landscape architecture, which has some really interesting articles and it's open access. So you don't need to go through the library to actually look at the um, articles. And then of course, the student magazine Curb out of RMIT has frequent issues on digital landscapes. So it's definitely a growing field. And I really wouldn't like us to see um, the School of Landscape Architecture at Lincoln being left behind in the space. So um, one of the um, ideas behind this is to actually look at um, the digital tools, which are changing very fast, with the aim of being able to better understand how these might work for us particularly because we're in this very, very unique um, opportunity of having the computing or computational staff working directly now with landscape architects in our school. So it's a really unique position that we're in and we need to capitalise on that in the next few years. What we're going to do today is we're going to just go through a very few um, examples of three key concepts because there isn't a lot of theoretical um, underpinning to digital design practices yet. Um, so I'm just going to take three key concepts from Wallace and Raman's book. The first one is topology, which is about surface manipulation. Second one is performative design. And in our case, we're going to look at um, the performance of site experience for users and parametric modelling, which is really connecting um, how simulations can take external data and input them into the design process. And um, fortunately, I've got Stuart, who's going to um, start, give us a little bit more information about that in the later part of this presentation, and then we'll conclude. So starting with surface manipulation, um, there are two terms that we need to be clear about. First of all is topography, which we should all be familiar with, and that's the study of the forms and features of land surfaces that can be represented to scale. The second one in the digital space is topology, which is the study of geometrical properties and spatial relations which remain unaffected by changes in size and shape. So in the literature, they talk about absolute location, which is what we work with when we try to pinpoint where something is on a topographical map. But topology is very much about relative positioning. So it's things that don't necessarily have an absolute location but are um, related um, in the digital space and their relativity is more important than their size and actual shape. Now, I've just put in some videos and I apologise if they're not crystal clear because I had to reduce the um, resolution when I imported them so that we could actually have a reasonable file size because our poor old computers here at Lincoln don't cope with um, large file sizes. And this is just to give you an idea of how the surface can be manipulated in a uh, software application called Unreal Engine. Can you hear that? It's uh, moving very uh, slowly, but yeah, no, it's it's working. Yeah, it's going to be some difference between the audio and video. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a bit glitchy, but it's fine. Should have put it on my Mac. Jill, we can't hear the audio. I don't know how to change that here. Oh, uh, it's fine. Okay, so I'll just keep talking. So what they're doing is they're moving a small piece of designed um, roadway, as you can see, into a three-dimensional landscape. And it's just a grid that you can change. You'll see in a minute the way you can actually create um, the typology 
uh, different elevations or relief around. And it's so quick these days. This, of course, is for the gaming industry. So it's very random. In our world, what we have to do is work out a workflow to bring in actual topo topography. Topology. <laughs> topography into this model so we can then add in these animated versions of some of the um, uh, created worlds that we would be working with. And you can see just this has come an amazing distance since I first started in virtual environments. It's just amazing what can be done. So what they call this is a, basically a rubber sheet. You can literally um, change the morphology of the surface to suit whatever your requirements are. Ours would have to be actual levels and, and models that we would bring in as elevation models from the real world. That would be our challenge. So that would be done through ArcGIS. Would be so much so much better if you could actually hear this guy talking about it. So um, that gives you a bit of an understanding of the photorealism that's going in and how you can position small pieces of design work that are all created in this Unreal Engine and then create the topography around it. This, of course, <clears throat> we have this gear already in the um, in the school. This is another way of bringing um, haptic or tactile feedback in terms of creating a uh, the landform um, and the computer can actually read the changes in the real world and upload it and then um, make adjustments to how that topographical change has been made. And in this particular circumstance, it's actually using the topography to work out how um, flood levels might actually, or water levels might exist within this topographical change. And I think this is really fascinating. The only thing is that we're not really using it. We've got the gear, but we're not really using it in terms of its capability yet in what we do. So in other schools, they use this uh, augmented reality sandbox to actually create different types of uh, topography to, to experiment with how a particular site might be recontoured, for example. The next um, concept is performative design. This is where appearance and performance are integrated. Um, particularly as design tools increase the capacity to link analysis, generation and performance. Um, in other words, it's, it's shifting our attention from what the landscape is to what it does. It's no longer just a product or an output, it's actually a pro process or a performance that's being created. And any time you see students creating these um, these sequences of over time of what the site might actually be, that's really performative design. But computers can take that so much further. Um, in, our, um, in our research, this was up at Kuratafati at Castle Hill Rocks, um, performance was really, um, Performance of the site in relation to users was what we were researching in the summer of 2019-2020. And this was where just waiting for my computer to change. So um, we had different scenarios that we created. Oops, just go back. So the performative design aspect was how can we change or how is the site going to change with increased tourist pressure? Now, what we haven't done yet is actually create different designed spaces in terms of 
change, changes to vegetation, changes to fencing, changes to signage, which is what we tried to simulate in two-dimensional photo montages. But the, there's a lot of limitations in terms of asking people's preferences from a two-dimensional screenshot of something. What I find interesting, though, is how um, this performative design aspect is actually being used not just in our research study, but also by the Tiarawa River Iwi Trust um, up on the Waikato River. And they've set up a really neat website um, where you can even go to an IPO where you scan or tap your um, iPhone onto a um, site-based um, signage stand and then you can go, it takes you into this website. And one of the things that they're doing just like us is that they've got a series of questions that you can answer in terms of your, you know, did this create a better understanding or a relationship with the actual river and did it meet your expectations, which was very similar to our study, although we didn't have a permanent um, sign to actually work with up at Kurutafiti. But I think this is going to be more and more the um, case. Now, going back to Kurutafiti then, the, um, what we had to do with um, working up there for, as researchers, Don and I, we had to actually ask permission from Naitahu, who own this land, but it's managed by the Department of Conservation or DOC. And the person that we spoke to about getting permission to work on this site was Arapata Rubin. Now, he was telling us that Castle Hill Rocks isn't actually the limestone rock formations. It's actually this mountain that we look across the valley towards when we're actually on the site, which then made us think about, well, what would this site look like um, from a different perspective? If we weren't looking at it from coming up the path, what would, be, what it, what would it look like if we were actually looking down on it? And one of the things that has come up recently is whether or not we could actually imagine what this site might be might look like if it was revegetated completely. So this is another video that actually shows you the possibility of how we could revegetate um, the Kuritafiti area very quickly. be so much better if you could hear the <laughs> commentary but you'll see in a minute how the um all of the different individual trees have different attributes and you can set that up and then you can literally paint the foliage on but just imagine doing something like that with a model that was set up on the top of one of Kurutafiti's rocks and you could actually look down over a vast area, how quick it would be to actually create a forest below you. The other thing to also be aware of too, if we're going to be doing these photorealism um, visualisations, is the different time of year. And that's something that you can set up quite easily in the Unreal Engine software. So um, it might be something that people could actually choose to select when they're actually on site. They could look at it, you know, in the, in the autumn or the winter or in the middle of summer. Or they could look at it, we could show them what these, you can see these plantings that have just gone in last year. What would that look like if they started to actually increase in size over a period of time. So there's all sorts of things that we could do to manipulate in terms of performative design, and then we could engage with users in terms of what that would be to them, what their preferences would be. And one of the things that has um, also been identified is that um, we might be able to do a time sequence. So go back to if we, these, drawings, and I, I, I realised that um, uh, Mata, <coughs> Mata Arua, I don't know if that's the right way, is up in the North Island, but 
what I'm trying to find is some of the artworks from Europeans that were originally um, produced to get a, some idea of what some of these landscapes might be. And probably by 1860, a lot of the trees had been cleared, I'm guessing. But if we went back to 1760, we might see a very different landscape. And certainly by 1960, which is within living memory, we should be able to, to simulate pretty much what was there by the time pastoralists and so on came in to, to take over some of this land. So I think being able to develop models that can take us back in time, if I had um, my wish, I'd be a time traveller so I could go back and have a look at some of these places. Um, it gives us that, that possibility. The last um, um, concept is parametric modelling, and this is where the importance of composition and geometries and shape is replaced by specific parameters or rules for a design outcome. Um, for example, you might have um, a dead cell next to an alive cell, and then because of that proximity, the dead cell becomes alive or the alive cell becomes dead because they're in close, in close proximity or a certain distance from one another. So that would be a parameter or a rule that could be built into the algorithm, algorithms of a particular simulation model. Or you could have, for example, behavioural attributes um, um, built into what they call agent-based uh, simulation, which is illustrated in this little picture here where you've got agent points moving to attraction points and leaving behind trails in model space. So just imagine what you could do if you could look at, say, sheep moving around the landscape or people moving around a publicly um, accessible public open space. So parametric modelling um, is becoming more and more um, of interest to us, or it should be more of interest to us. And one of those places not only could be Kurutafti, but could also be the Styx River. Now, what we've already done is we've already um, had Brian Mason uh, Scientific and Technical Trust Grant to actually produce some more signs for the Styx catchment. So you can stand at a particular location, look at, look at the site, but also get this extra information. And what they've asked us to do is look at creating more signs. And we, we recommended that we stick to this long linear um, signage um, form which is a really good way of actually being able to look over and into a particular space, but also have the information that's um, related to it. <clears throat> so what Aria Wang, who was one of our former master's students, did was she created a series of graphic panels for placement in different locations through the, through the catchment. And all of this information is based on scholarly work that's been done by summer scholars um, over the past 17 years. And this is the sort of work that I would love to see brought into the virtual space. So you actually stand at a particular location and you can um, uh, scan your QR code, which would take you to a virtual um, animated or recreated space where you could actually see some of this information in a more realistic way. Um, and there's quite a lot of information that we've got, not only for um, the microbiotic um, world, the uh, uh, invertebrates and arthropods and algae and so on, there's also um, an interest in developing something that could explain more about Mahinga Kai all along the Styx River. So there's lots of potential. And this is just to show you a video because I know it's possible because I actually have done it with another company in Brisbane just to give you a bit of an idea of the sorts of, if you wanted to actually show people under the water what was there in terms of um, what 
instead of trying to imagine the information on the signage, you can actually bring it to life. I think the power of this sort of animation work is the fact that you can show people what they can't see in reality. That's the big step forward. Now, in the Brisbane Botanic Gardens, you can't see any of this. The pond is just really mucky and, you know, there's nothing you can see. But in the animation world, you can actually create the, the, the creek bed the way you want it. Yes, we do have eels in Australia and ducks. Um, and you can have the kind of um, macrophytes that would be um, that either colonise or should be there. These are tardigrades or water bears that are microscopic. Um, and this is, if, if you can imagine standing on a bridge looking at the Styx River flowing past you and then being able to see via your device what is going on under the water in terms of sediment, um, turbidity, um, the different aquatic organisms, the plants, the little animals, the things that actually then depend on high quality water, then we've got more of a chance of actually making people more aware of how to protect our waterways. Um, this you really need to listen to the audio, but I'll do my best to do a simulation of what they're talking about. So what he's saying is we've created this river in the landscape which can be moved because it's a procedural um, representation of the river. You can just see the centre line through the middle of the river, but it's a very artificial colour. Which is very strange. So what he wants to do is he wants to change it so it looks more like a stream. So he's changing the colour attributes so it becomes a lot more natural looking. So he's changing it from aquamarine to, to brown. So it starts to look like it fits into the landscape a little bit better. You can also change the current, you can change the movement of the water in the um, real engine. And now he's going to change scattering. So it's like fog for water. He's just changing the settings. So now the water has changed from being really clear to quite muddy, as if it's carrying sediment downstream. So it makes the stream look like it's carrying a certain amount of sediment. Now, the possibilities for us is to actually um, connect what it looks like with a, a scale of um, real world data that's. Um, and captured through sensors in the real world. This is what we start to move towards a digital twin of something that works in the real world but also works in the virtual environment. It's now changing the refraction from parameters because it's refracting a little bit too much, it's too strong. So now he's just reduced the refraction. Now he's saying the other problem is that we've put the river over the top of grass. And if you go underwater, basically seeing the kind of grass that would be on the surface, trees are water in the middle of the stream. So what he wants to do is change the specific material that's on the riverbed. And this is where you can have a stream in one place that's completely different from another place. The kind of stones and the kind of riverbed underneath the streams that we're trying to animate 
are appropriate to um, New Zealand, and that's the big challenge. This is inspirational stuff. This is a company that did the um, visualisation for the America's Cup, and the audio is going to be a little bit off, um, doesn't quite match the video, but um, you'll get to see what um, Build Design has done in terms of Wellington. It was a project that was funded by Wellington City Council, and it's a little bit of inspiration. It's a shame you can't hear what he's saying, but he's, he's basically saying that they're pushing what could be possible in Unreal Engine. So they've created a digital twin of the whole of Wellington. So it's critical that we decide what we actually want to achieve. So here they wanted to have it as real as possible. So we're looking for um, the availability of really good spatial data from multiple um, agencies. So architects, surveyors, engineers can all be coordinated on the same grid. An Unreal Engine can take a huge amount of data. So contour data is created the terrain model. So individual shape files are imported into 3D Max and then exported into Unreal Engine. So Wellington City Council supplied the photogrammetry for all of the 18,000 buildings in Wellington. And then the optimization tools were coordinated to, to create an accurate model of trees and wind turbines. So Wellington Twin is connected to multiple sensors across Wellington. The cyclist movements, pollution levels, temperature, weather. Different data sources bring in this sensor data. This is what we're talking about in terms of parametric design. So these are all the different um, projects that can be modelled and then put out for consultation to uh, local communities. The consultation phase is really critical where all the information is in the same place so that everybody can actually access the information that makes all of these connections that we're always trying to develop. So it demonstrates to the public that they're valued and their input is useful. So I'm going to pass over to Stuart now. Um, would you like to um, take over, Stuart? Thanks, Jill. Um, so Jill's given um, a, a really good background to a range of, of different things. And I want to now just talk around one of our uh, projects that we're doing with the Centre uh, for Designing Future Productive Landscapes. Um, and this is um, work that um, Boffer Miskel have been um, involved or have produced the, the virtual reality aspects of. And um, a big thanks also to LandPro, um, a company who have gathered um, aerial imagery and um, digital terrain models um, through LiDAR. For, for the work that I'm about to, to show you. Um, Jill's <coughs> talked to, um, about 
virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, um, and that in the concept of the design world. One of the, the key things I think that um, we see that this these tools and these digital processes can do is augment and amplify. So in many cases, people have develop tools looking to replace humans. Um, we're looking now more though at keeping humans in the loop and using the skills that, that people are um, good at to um, complement where the computers can help us. So um, augment reality um, and also amplify intelligence rather than um, replace uh, people and things with with computers. So working together. Um, Jill, if you can go on to the next slide. I'm trying. So when it comes up, the next slide will um, there we go. be um, from um, a virtual reality model of the Lincoln University Mount Grand Station down in Harweer. Um, this is a model that has been generated in Unreal Engine by Corey Murray at Offer um, And what it and the the way that this model was built, and at the moment it's been built fairly manually. Um, and one of our projects is looking at being able to automate or semi-automate um, some of that workflow, has been taking uh, digital data that represents the terrain and aerial imagery, bringing that into Unreal Engine to show the, the actual uh, terrain and um, what the, the colours and ground cover were like. This imagery was flown in winter, so in some parts um, you can see uh, snow uh, on the, the tops of the mountains. Um, and then to that environment, other things have been added. So we've added in trees. Um, and this is about taking uh, an environment that already exists and modeling, in this case, a uh, potential future scenario. Um, as I said, this has been done uh, largely manually. Um, and but we're looking and moving towards um, this concept of a, a digital twin and trying to be able to do this um, automatically or semi-automatically. In um, this type of uh, work, we've got two different interests. Um, the first one is um, a visual interest, uh, um, which is really around engagement and communication. Um, there are stakeholders involved with the station um, that we want to communicate potential future designs for the station to and um, showing them what the station could look like in future. Now, remember, it's a prediction, not reality, is an important part of um, helping bring them on board. Um, if you've seen the, the TV show My Home, Home Made Perfect, in that show, what they do is present um, two competing architects' designs for a remodel of a house in virtual reality, and people are able to experience that and explore that before the before the building work happens, and they get to understand how their space will, will be um, when it's remodeled. Um, the same concept here, we're looking to show what the, the landscape looked like um, over time as, as work is, is done. Jill, if you could go on to the next um, slide. Um, what, what this screenshot doesn't um, show, and, and I managed to crash our computer, our virtual reality computer, while I was trying to get a, a live video recording of this, is um, that what we're also able to do is add um, animation and, and sound. So in the trees, we're able to have um, bird song um, and show the, the um, ambiance and, and um, soundscape of the space, but also we're able to have animation and movement on uh, the, the animals in the space. Um, at, at the moment, that's all programmatic animation, um, so they, all of the animals are fairly static, but um, are just look, um, are able to move. But over time, um, Jill mentioned agent-based simulations. Um, what we'll be able to do is model sheep behavior and see how they um, change their behavior as we do things like 
put down different ground covers. Um, and Jill also talked about making uh, visible the unseen, um, whether that's under the, the sea, under the, the riverbed, um, but also um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you can imagine that within these environments through um, trans or semi-transparent layers and in different colours, you can um, show the the carbon dioxide being taken in by the tree, the oxygen being given off, um, the carbon dioxide and methane being released by livestock on on the farm, so that you get not um, only an idea of the aggregate carbon that the flux is in those greenhouse gases, but you get to to understand um, the dynamically changing nature of those and how that works as a as a cycle within the environment. So that's really the other phase of the work that we're looking at is using these um, as a, um, a representation of the output of simulations and models um, so that we can explore um, what things look like in the real world. And that, that visualization aspect is really important because um, often when you're building simulations and models, um, you can run them and you get out numbers and, and, and things. But it's very hard to validate those um, just by looking at, at the results that are, are brought out. But often what you can see by visualising them and, and making those real is things that aren't behaving correctly and things that aren't working as you as you expect. So um, there's both a, a, a end user communication aspect um, to developing these types of models, but also um, a, uh, a validation and verification. Um, and of course, when you go on to uh, model what the future could look like, you're never going to be 100% um, correct, but you can start to predict out. And then if you are also doing real world measurements, you can start to then bring in those real world measurements and um, put those against the predictions that you made to improve your, your models. So Jill, if you go on to the next um, slide. Um, so overall, the type of um, environment um, that we're talking about here is is not only the graphical one at the the, the top, but also um, bringing in lots of data and, and information and computational simulations below that, um, running in a computational environment um, and data being passed back and forwards. Taking that a step further, you get to see people um, interacting with the environment um, and that that flowing back down through to maybe f fire off a new model to be run a new simulation, um, updating um, observed data to go and correct those future predictions. And so you get a bit of a loop um, running uh, where you've got that human in, in, in the middle because um, one of the things that we're really good at as, as humans is thinking of questions to ask. Computers are really good at running models and simulations, but they're not so great at coming up with uh, the questions that we should be asked. What should be we be looking at? What is interesting? Um, and so um, there's a lot of talk of, of data-driven science and, and just, of course, you need then um, machine learning and, and things to go and process that. But to get your machines to process the data, you have to be asking a question and you have to be um, setting those up in the way, in the right way. So by having the, the human in the loop, um, you're setting up the right the questions to ask, um, you're able to do exploration, um, you're able to interpret uh, information coming through, understand when things are not running in the way that you would expect and of course things that aren't working in the way that you expect uh, are often the interesting things and then that gives you the opportunity to go and explore um, that is is what we're observing in the real world or sorry in the simulated world um, an accurate reflection of what will happen in the real world um, or is it uh, an aberration in our simulation or our model um, and how do we correct that um, the other thing that the, the virtual world gives us is the opportunity to try out lots of different um, interventions and strategies um, and see what they might look like in, in the future. Uh, one of the, the things that's always hard to do is, is know um, where things will, will end up. 
and um, using simulations and models, we can move further down that track, which makes us, which allows us to try um, different interventions and uh, look at them over 10, 20, 50 years perhaps, uh, and see see where they end up. So <coughs> something that looked um, really good in the short term, in the long term may not work out as well as another option. Um, and the virtual environment then gives us a, an environment that we can explore those different interventions and different options um, within. So we, we with this project, um, we see that um, Mount Grand is an, an ideal case study to, to try um, evaluating some different interventions that people wish to, to try in terms of redesigning what that station looks like, um, different types of agriculture or agroforestry that might be used on, on the in the space, um, but also an opportunity because it's within a university environment um, to deploy different amounts of um, sensing uh, and different models and simulations it's a site that we've collected data on over a number of years in different forms, so we have quite a rich um, set of data um, already existing. So um, this is one example of some of the work that's going on here at, at Lincoln, um, along with the, the work up at Castle Hill that Jill's talked about, the work that we're doing um, on the Styx River, um, that brings um, some of these aspects uh, in together and um, lets us explore what um, the digital mediated space looks like. Jill, do you want to go on to? Yep, oh, I'm stuck again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I think our, our next slide is is a bit of a, a, a conclusion um, and then an opportunity um, for, for a yeah. bit of discussion and, and asking questions. So Jill, back to you. So, yeah, thanks Stuart. Um, so what we wanted to show you today is, is what's possible in a very simplified way, really, because it gets, obviously, this whole field gets quite complicated. And I'm not a computational person, but luckily we've got computational people on staff now. Um, where, are, where we are at is that clearly our computers don't cope at all with the work that we're trying to do. So one of the first things we've got to do this year is put in a bid for money for high-spec computers that can run these really um, large data sets and simulations that we want to do so we can start developing or getting expertise with the tools. So um, once we've got some high-spec computers, then we can actually show, um, start putting together some of the software like Unreal Engine and mapping ArcGIS, maybe 3D Max. Rhinoceros is another um, software application that's used and working out how we um, export different files, file types from one to another. So we need to work out what the workflow would be to suit our needs. And then of course, we need some people who are interested in project work. And we're probably thinking of masters and PhD students at this stage. So anybody who might be interested, we'd love to hear from you. Um, at the moment, the three projects that we're focusing on is Kuratafati, um, Styx River and Mount Grand. But that's not to say that we're limited to those projects only. They're the ones that we're kind of furthest along working on. Um, and um really um yeah that's where we're up to so um any questions or any suggestions would be very welcome thanks very much thank you jill and thank you 